you for your patience with our technical difficulties. I'm John Farrell at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, I'll give a little more introduction on the work that we do, but um, as you might gather from the name, we focus a lot on local and also how communities can meet their own needs uh, in their local economy across a lot of different sectors. So I wanted to just start out with a question, why get 100% locally? Why are we interested in getting to 100% renewables and why do it um, nearby? So let's warm up with a little quiz. We're talking about wind power potential in the state of Minnesota. There's a lot of wind here. You saw already in a couple of presentations about wind power, how much RP you already gets. And so as a percentage of state electricity sales, what percent could wind power supply as a percentage of our state's electricity sales on an annual basis? And I'm not saying like we would just get power from wind energy in that potential mix, but how much wind relative to how much energy we use? So I have any takers on 25%. How about on 55%? 175%? C? All right. How about D? 2,500%? And then the real optimist in the room, anyone for letter E? 27,000%? All right. Yeah, of course, the Sierra Club guy, they just got his hand up. Uh, the answer is 2,500%. I say this not because this number really means a whole lot, other than um, we've got a lot of wind resource in Minnesota. And as Alan mentioned before, uh, it's very cheap. The Excel Energy CEO, among many others, has noted that this is the cheapest resource that we have when we want to build new power generation. So renewables aren't just available all over the place, but they're also the cheapest thing that we can use to supply our electricity needs, which is very exciting. As a side note, Excel, even though Excel CEO is talking a lot about wind power, they're also at the legislature right now trying to get a check for their nuclear power plant. Uh, that's a very bad idea. So if you want to see a video about that, go to our website, ILSR.org. <laughs> Let's do another quiz. We'll do this one about solar. So let's talk about rooftop solar. So now we're talking about solar energy. We've got lots of sun available. We're talking about just about rooftops, though, not like all the land that we could use, but just on uh, the roofs of uh, commercial businesses, the roofs of residential buildings. How much solar could we get as a percentage of our total sales in Minnesota? So do I have any takers for A, 2%? All right, 15%, B? C, 39%? A couple takers, three takers, all right. D, 59%? E, 112%? All right, Sierra Club, yeah, there we go, perfect. All right, the answer is C, 39%. And again, like, we're not gonna cover every single rooftop with solar. There's lots of reasons, including economic reasons, that people have for choosing to do solar or not do solar, but the idea, again, is that we have a lot of resource and it's, it's in our communities. It's where we are, it's where we live, that we can tap this resource. And in fact, all across the country, there's an enormous solar resource available on rooftops. Minnesota is among many other states that can get a high percentage of their electricity from rooftop uh, resources alone. Uh, so a really impressive opportunity that we have to tap the renewable resources in our communities. Um, so the first answer to this question, why get 100% locally, is simply because we can. We can get it and we can also get it from very cheap resources that we can get locally. So that's a very exciting thing. The second reason that we should investigate doing this is that Rochester is not alone in pursuing this goal. There are lots of other places across the country. In fact, there are over 50 U.S. cities in the orange and in the yellow here that have made commitments to get to 100% renewable energy by some certain date. Most of them around 2030, actually. Some of them a little bit later, some of them earlier. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of places are trying to pursue this um, and don't even have the same kind of resources that Rochester has in this pursuit. Um, so another question for you. You didn't know there were gonna be this many quiz questions, I'm sorry. Um, what state will by 2020 have two cities that have reached 100% renewable electricity? Just go ahead and throw out a name. Minnesota, Minnesota I like that. California, Hawaii, Hawaii Oregon. Oregon. Texas. Texas, there we go, it is Texas. Georgetown and Denton, Texas will be two cities that have reached 100% renewable energy by 2020. And coincidentally, they both have municipal electric utilities, just like Rochester. And so not only is Rochester, among many other cities that are considering this across the country, they have a unique opportunity by owning an electric utility, by owning our electric company, to pursue this, to make the decision uh, uh, because they have local decision-making authority. And uh, there are other, one, other utilities already across the country that can help show the way. So, why local? We can, because we can. Another reason why local, because we're not alone. There are other things, other ways that we can do this. Another reason is that generating energy locally has particular advantages. I apologize, this chart is really busy. But there's basically two things to think about in this chart. As you go from left to right, we are increasing the size of a solar array. So the stuff on here is big solar, and the stuff over here is rooftop solar. And the height of the bar is the cost of that energy to the utility company. And the key thing here is that we're looking at a couple of different things. Um, there's a lot of different ways that 
we can in the utility business and in the energy business compare energy costs. We can compare energy costs at the point where we generate it. So if we do that, we're comparing like a coal energy power plant and a solar power plant, and we say, okay, when the energy comes off of that thing and goes into the grid, how much did it cost to generate it? That's usually the number that we hear about. And so we end up comparing like a really huge coal-fired power plant that's like 1,000 megawatts with one solar panel or something like that. But it also doesn't really reflect where we use that energy, where it's delivered to. And that's another key piece of this. And so you see over here on the right-hand side, there's a little bit of gray bars on top of the orange ones that represent the delivery cost for energy that's generated far away. So the really big solar power plants are not going to be built in town. Uh, they're not going to even be built right outside of town. They're going to be built a few hundred miles away. And we're going to deliver that on transmission lines. But we have to take that into account. We lose some of that energy in transmission. Sometimes it's expensive to get that capacity from the transmission system in order to use it. The other thing that we have to take into account is the energy that we produce on our own rooftops. A lot of that is actually offsetting use within our own property. So think of it as like, I installed those LED light bulbs that I got from RPU, or I installed an energy efficient refrigerator. I'm reducing my energy consumption. I'm reducing what energy is that I'm demanding from the grid. So we don't actually, as a utility, as a grid consumers, have to buy all that power. We only have to buy the portion that actually flows out of that, out of that customer's premise, out of the house, uh, out of the of commercial business. And so what you see on the left here, I've taken the retail cost of energy to these customers and cut it in half. Because on, on average, about half of the energy that is produced on a home, so from a home solar array or a business solar array actually flows back into the grid. And so when you, when you look at it this way, and you can see in the top here, just to help highlight it, I have two apples. This is the apples to apples comparison of the cost of energy. And you find that local energy is actually more cost effective than we often see because we're often getting uh, the wrong kind of comparison. There's a blog post on our website if you want the other charts that go with this, you want to really dive in. <laughs> Another thing that we don't talk about very often is what's the local benefit? So when we produce energy locally, when we spend money to build a project, an uh, energy project locally, a lot of those dollars stay in our local economy. We're hiring local accountants, local contractors, that kind of thing. Um, I'm sure RPU could talk to you about that when they build something that's uh, within their service territory instead of buying it from somewhere else. And so here you have, uh, that those cost advantages averaged out over the lifetime of a solar array um, added in here. So you can see from small scale solar, almost four cents a kilowatt hour, um, or about you know a, a third or a half of what you might pay for a kilowatt hour from the utility company, uh, is actually retained within the local economy. Now this isn't gonna show up on your electric bill. It's not gonna show up on the ledger at RPU when they're taking into cost, costs and benefits. But it is, as a city, something that you consider, as a community that you can consider in terms of where you get your energy, is that there are these benefits that we don't often count, and they can be very significant relative to the cost of your energy. You know, on, on my electric bill up in Minneapolis, I pay about 12 cents a kilowatt hour, so a, a locally generated kilowatt hour of solar gives back almost a third of that in terms of local economic benefits, just at the installation. And that doesn't even cost how, uh, take into account the fact that the person who owns that solar array might respend those dollars that they've saved somewhere else in the local community, increasing that benefit. So another way to look at that chart is if you take the first one I had and you kind of mash it up with the second one, and you now have in blue there sort of the subtraction of the cost from the local economic benefits you get from local solar, from rooftop solar, from the cost that we pay the utility. And you can see we flipped it completely around, the conventional wisdom that bigger is going to get you cheaper energy. And now when we talk about the actual benefit to the community, it can be cheaper to be local. So that's a great reason to spend our money locally and to generate our energy from local sources. So I want to talk just really quickly about three ways that communities are showing leadership around this. And this is not just necessarily about the electric utility, but about what can be done in communities to move us toward 100% renewables. And these all come from a, a thing that we have on our website called the Community Power Toolkit, which looks at kind of three different uh, intersection points between individuals and the energy economy. Um, one of them is just something that you can do with your neighbors. So there are a lot of really interesting um, organizations out there, co-ops, um, not electric co-ops, but other kinds of co-ops. So if people banding together to do like group purchases of solar. So instead of going solar by yourself, you find 15 or 20 of your neighbors. And Solar United Neighbors, which does this in a number of different states, has found that they can reduce the cost to individuals by about 25%. But when they do this, they get 30 households together, invest about a million dollars in solar in the local economy, about 200 kilowatts of solar, and they create six jobs in the local economy. So it's a great way that you can invest in local energy and you don't even need your utility company necessarily to do that, although it sounds like they have some good rebates, so don't miss out on those. A second thing is looking at the way that utilities can help folks to make energy saving investments. So one of the things that we heard about was that we might be missing, we might be past the point where we've gotten the low-hanging fruit for energy efficiency. So what else can we do? 
Well, there's some interesting co-ops in the southeastern portion of the United States. They serve areas in Appalachia, very predominantly poor places, places where folks, even if they have a rebate, are not going to have the money up front to pay for insulation in their homes or for an energy efficient appliance or a, or a new air conditioner. And the utility is actually providing the capital to them to make those investments because they recognize this is going to have a system-wide benefit. That power plant that we just built in Rochester could have been twice as big if we hadn't made those conservation improvements. And those utilities are recognizing that and saying, hey, if we've got someone who's current on their utility bill and it's going to have this system-wide benefit if they make conservation investments, we'll help them pay it and then they'll pass back on the utility bill right where they're going to see the savings from that. And usually it's structured in such a way that people actually still pay less every month and they pay back that cost to the utility company. And you find that this is normally done by nonprofit utilities like co-ops and municipal utilities that have that public service um, uh, 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 frame of mind. And so I think it's a great kind of thing to consider, especially if you've already felt, felt like you've reached many of the people who can be reached. Uh, and here's just a map of some of the states that have adopted this kind of policy and some of the co-ops that have done this policy across the United States. And the last one is looking at what, what can you do at the city. So I'm not saying that Rochester should do this and require that solar has to be installed on all the buildings. But there are lots of interesting ways to leverage local power and authority, whether it's about the permitting that is required to do a solar array on a home, or the requirements that you have for new buildings uh, it, it, within a community that uh, the city can work together, in this case, with the electric utility to leverage more investments in clean energy. So why local? We can do it. Rochester is not the only one doing it. You're not alone. There are other cities that are doing this that are municipal utilities and it keeps dollars within the local community.